creature suffers nothing to remain in her kingdoms which cannot help itself. He is no whole man until he knows how to earn a blameless livelihood. Society is barbarous until every industrious man gets his living without dishonest customs. Ralph Waldo Emerson The rules have changed. In a single generation, revolutions in technology have transformed the way we live, work, and do business. President Obama. The course of life is a constant. The patterns of birth, growth, and death will remain the same regardless of the state of things. But throughout every age, there are those who dare to come up with innovations so that the rest of us can lead an easier and more comfortable life. Right now, you know, starting in the late 80s till, till now, we are in a major inflection point in, in human civilization. I think it's an uncertain time, but I think it's a very exciting time. We are at an extraordinary time in the history of this planet. Global competition is very, very challenging. I don't think there's ever been a better time to be alive than, than right now. If you are not doing some things that are crazy, then you're doing the wrong things. Larry Page, co-founder of Google. Now, more than ever, consumers put a premium on innovation and creativity. This, they feel, will enable them to choose the best products and pursue careers that promise the most opportunities. This, however, is tricky as new and fresh ideas often have shelf lives of just a few years, sometimes a few months. The world as it exists today, wealth is not primarily judged in terms of land or of industry or even of money. The basic currency is ideas. The good news is that the capacity to innovate and the incentive towards innovation have never been as rapid and ubiquitous as they are today. At a time when many feared that the desire to read was shrinking, the Amazon Kindle was launched. This device gives readers a brand new way to control what they read at any given moment. And then there is iTunes. When Apple broke the monopoly of the music industry, they empowered listeners to take control of their personal record collections. Now, iTunes dominates most media marketplaces, Hollywood movies, podcasts, and even books and magazines. The consumer can program his television viewing habits and no longer has to allow a network to dictate the pace at which he watches his favorite TV drama. He has even taken television away from the television set. The consumer has also found easier ways of becoming the creator. Websites like Kickstarter have cut out the middleman so that artists can fund projects themselves. Even our celebrities have followed suit. Corporations have felt the demand for more creativity, more innovation and more individual expression, and they have responded. Innocentive is a global leader in crowdsourcing, an innovation trend in which thousands of individuals compete to provide solutions to the world of business, policies to the world of politics, and ideas to the world of science. The effects of digital fabrication on manufacturing have created a new industrial revolution. Moreover, advances in robotics are reshaping how factories and warehouses operate. One such robot is Baxter, designed by Rethink Robotics Rodney Brooks, a former MIT professor. Baxter comes with a unique low price point and provides a compelling alternative to low-cost offshoring for manufacturers of all sizes. Here, we can see how robotics and automation have affected the automobile industry.
come a time when these robots and automation systems take over the majority of routine jobs? We live in a dramatically new world. We live in a world where it's no longer about command and control, it's about connect and collaborate. I mean, you look at the, the net right now, and what it's done is it's literally democratized leadership. Every single person can have an impact, every single person can have a following, every single person can have a platform, whether it's on Facebook or on Twitter or on YouTube. So my message is really a simple one, which is no matter what your title is, no matter what your station in society is, no matter what your background is, it's no longer a valid excuse to say, I can't lead, I can't have an impact. It's no longer an excuse to say, I'm a taxi driver, so I can't influence other people. No matter who we are, where we work, where we live, around the world, every single one of us can shift from being a victim to showing leadership. Earth is divided up into natural barriers. Throughout man's primitive beginnings, the only means of transportation were animals and one's own feet, until the invention of the wheel. Then, civilization began to move forward at a faster pace than ever before. But there were some natural barriers that continued to serve as obstacles to mankind's evolution. Among them was the ocean. So man found a way to overcome that obstacle by inventing the sailboat. Water was a barrier no longer. Centuries later, James Watt's steam engine brought forth a mammoth innovation that yielded the railroads of the land and the steam ships of the sea. By the mid-19th century, Samuel Morse had given us the telegraph. By the late 19th century, Alexander Graham Bell had delivered the telephone. These new forms of transportation and communication broke down almost every natural barrier there was, bringing people closer together and making the world smaller and smaller. The only barrier left was the sky. In 1903, the Wright brothers took part in their first successful flight. In the past, artisans crafted with their hands. It was this alone that determined the quality of their products. During the industrialization process, man created machines that would reduce the rigors of labor considerably. Meanwhile, the seeds of wireless communication and satellite technology were sown throughout the 20th century. Once these seeds blossomed, people were able to send messages to any part of the globe in no time at all. Furthermore, the invention of semiconductors and transistors triggered revolutions in radio, television and computers. But the real magic began when the internet was finally commercialized in the 1990s, followed closely by the creation of the World Wide Web at the hands of Sir Tim Barnes-Lee in 1991. This was the point when the nature of innovation evolved into an exponential fashion. The great minds responsible for every leap forward knew that the established wisdom of their times was not absolute. They trusted their instincts and were bold enough to pursue a better world for future generations. Today, we call these great minds revolutionaries. They spearheaded revolutions in science, in philosophy, in spirituality, in the arts, in democracy and in human rights, and finally, in science and technology. In every innovation age, there are many bold souls with moonshot thinking skills who are able to cook up grand surprises for the masses. But in spite of overcoming geographical barriers, man has still had to deal with various challenges. Disease. Natural disasters. 
bloodshed. Economic crises and a myriad of other difficulties that have threatened to slow our progress. And yet, man has always prevailed. Thanks to scores of innovators who use their creative potential enough to march forward, help us to thrive and lead us to a new age of progress. Are the challenges we face in the 21st century any different from those we've encountered in the past? Could it be that the only thing changing is the nature of the challenges itself? In the old days, all you had to learn the motions were expected of you. Think, for example, of Taylor's work. Not, a, not you didn't have that many choices. You, you got the job. The promise, the, the promise was you do a good job. The government, the people, you'll get a pension. You just got to know what the skills are that they taught you when you were 20. as technology continues to evolve exponentially. Those who work routine labor jobs have found their careers under threat from computers that can do their jobs in a cheaper and arguably more efficient way. We've seen variations on this before, when Western factories are relocated to those where cheap labor is instantly accessible. Today, the economy is faced with another disruptive business model the online job market. Anyone with a special talent, a computer and an internet connection can start a career as a freelancer, receiving commissions from all over the world. Any job that can be eliminated either by cheap labor or by internet freelancing is at risk. A New York City grad student may now face competition from an equally hard-working young person in India. The cost for a business of failing to tap into the global network is exorbitant, while the benefits can be infinite. I think this world is in a very fascinating time. I mean, there's never been so much change, there's never been so much uncertainty, there's never been so many people who are going through this state of confusion. There's never been so much disruption. But old structures must be disrupted before new and better structures can start to show up. Let us meet some truly creative minds of the new age. A young man who has disrupted such old structures and tapped into the unlimited potential of internet connectivity is Salman Khan, founder of Khan Academy, the world's largest virtual university. He is widely known as the major education reformer of the 21st century. Education, which is fundamentally about knowledge and information, and it, it's been completely static. It's, 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 it hasn't changed at all. And so, uh, you know, that little, the little inkling in my eye was that, was, 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 was that gee, you know, this, this video thing, well, why can't it reach everybody? And if you augment it with software, and if you augment it with all the other tools that exist in all these other industries, why can't you do something as fundamentally, um, um, uh, you know, that, that so fundamentally challenges the norm as, as a free world-class education for anyone? And I don't think we're anywhere near there yet, but that's our mission. And we're gonna, you know, everything we do is going to try to get us to that, to that ideal. Some of the videos available through Khan Academy include lessons on basic arithmetic problems as well as complex animation tutorials, US history lectures and lessons on the Industrial Revolution and it's all for free. Even Microsoft leader and billionaire Bill Gates uses Khan's materials and raves about them on his YouTube channel. It's all Khan has done is amazing. He's taken all this material 
and broken them down into little 12-minute lectures. Uh, I use it myself to remind myself of things. I have children who like it. I think it's a huge contribution. I, I was tutoring my, my cousins, literally, and uh, I, I, I had to kind of figure out a way to, to scale myself up, so I started rec recording YouTube videos, and I started making little software modules for them, but I, I made, made it so anyone could use them, and, and it started getting a lot of traction. But beyond these simple and accessible videos, there is something behind the enormous success of Sal Khan and his dedicated team at Khan Academy. What makes him such a force of nature in the education world? I see Sal Khan as a pioneer in an overall movement to use technology to let more and more people learn things, know where they stand. Uh, it's the start of a revolution. Phil Libin is the CEO of Evernote, one of the fastest growing cloud technology-based companies in the world. Evernote's mission is to help people around the globe to remember everything, capture anything, and access it anywhere. Uh, there's certainly nothing original in that concept with Evernote. People have been creating ways to, to, to write things down and capture memories and, and, and organize them for, for tens of thousands of years. Um, I think when we decided that this was the right time to build Evernote, we did it because we thought the technology was just getting to the point where it was feasible to really tackle this idea, to take this great old idea of improving everyone's memory and actually build something that would be useful to hundreds of millions of people. Tony Shea is the Chief Executive Officer of Zappos.com, the most popular online shoe company in the world. Business, it's never a question of not having enough resources. It's a question of not having enough resourcefulness. A successful businessman at a young age, he is an inspirational force for millions of young entrepreneurs around the world. Growing up, one of my favorite TV shows was MacGyver. Uh, for, I don't know, for people that haven't seen it, he would always be stuck in these situations where he didn't have exactly the right ideal set of tools or resources that he needed in order to get out of a situation. But somehow he would figure out creatively, he would take, say, duct tape and a pencil and a paper clip and create a sailboat out of it, and, and then he'd be uh, the hero at the end of the hour. That's part of what I love about being an entrepreneur. You basically get to play MacGyver every day with business. Zappos.com is considered one of the best managed companies in the world. Both their business model and their success story are taught in business schools all around the globe. My inspiration for Exodus data centers was Walmart. K.B. Chandra Shekhar co-founded Exodus Communications Data Center in 1994. Under his watch, he saw quite a few technological giants launch into the stratosphere. His new company, Jamcracker, out in Santa Clara, California, is a pioneer of cloud service brokerage enablement solutions. If you look at Sam Walton, the way he developed it, he was the first one to develop the standard store formats what he used to call it as a class A, class B, class C, depending on the size of the town or the demographics. One day I was reading that book and that inspired me. And also about how he built such an empire. That led me to say, how I can apply those principles in the data center market. So if you ask, how did I come up with, um, say, neuromarketing, I did not sit in a chair like this one day and invent it and think about it. Not at all. Dr. A.K. Pradeep is the founder and CEO of Neurofocus, the world's leading neuromarketing firm. His company brings advanced neuroscience knowledge and expertise to the world of branding, product development, packaging, marketing, and advertising. I was working with a large company CMO. I was consulting with a person. And he said to me, listen Pradeep, we spend six billion on advertising and marketing. We don't quite know what we get for that. I said, my God, I don't know how to help you. It's a very hard question. 
So on the plane ride back to San Francisco, there was a guy sitting next to me and I asked him what he did for a living. And he said, oh, you know, I'm a neuroscientist. I said, well, what does a neuroscientist do? He said, well, I measure attention in children and help them when they don't pay enough attention. ADD, attention deficit disorders, I measure them and I treat them. When people have emotional problems and they, you know, don't quite know how to deal with them, I measure them and I treat them. When people have memory problems, especially when people age, there are memory problems. Uh, when people have memory problems, I measure them, the, the, the progress or the loss of it, and treat them. That's what I do for a living. I said, wait a minute. You measure attention, you measure emotion, and you measure memory. One hour ago, my friend asked me, does anybody pay attention to my advertising? Is anybody emotionally engaged with our brand? Does anybody remember our messaging? The very same things my friend said, I'm spending six billion in trying to find out, you are measuring in clinics every day. Why can I not apply this science to solve that problem? That is how NeuroFocus was born. With the old way of thinking, we cannot solve our new problems. We must learn to ask why and why not. George Bernard Shaw. These individuals, at once creative and innovative, represent a microcosm of the 21st century mavericks who are bringing radical breakthroughs to education, technology, business and engineering. One of the things that every great leader and every great business person has is not one of them accept the status quo. One of the most distinguishing characteristics of highly creative people, which is their ability to embrace the unknown, to be comfortable and even maintain their smile in the face of uncertainty and change. While qualities such as talent and higher education are important, these people share one singular quality that exists within all of us, courage. The courage to accept challenges and to break down barriers. For these revolutionaries, creativity is not just a passive acceptance of the established, but a proactive movement beyond the established. We cling to what I call the safe harbor of the known. We think that if we think the same thoughts, have the same conversations, watch the same TV shows, eat the same food, it's going to be safe. But actually, the riskiest move is staying in the comfort zone. True safety, true freedom, true leadership, true excellence, true happiness comes from one thing. Leaving the safe harbor of the known every single day and moving out to the blue ocean by taking risks, by learning, by stretching, by moving into your next level of excellence and possibility. Classical musician Benjamin Zander is an expert on creativity. He has led the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra since 1979 and is a Grammy nominee. He's an acclaimed conductor, composer and arranger and is also a teacher and a speaker. We get into patterns, safe patterns, which are routines which keep us on a firm path in which we don't really have to think and like you know, we get up in the morning and we do our hair, we brush our teeth and we have breakfast and we go to work and we come home and we sit and watch television and we have a cup of tea and we go to bed, right? At the end of that process we die and that's not a creative life.
creative life is where you, res you stay open to whatever comes towards you and instead of rejecting it, you embrace it and create something out of it. By trying this different way of doing things and different ways of thinking, you may actually find ways to change what you think is the life that has been imposed on you. One of the worst things for people to do, I think, is to take for granted that their position in life is fixed, that they have to go all through life doing what everybody else wants them to do or what, what the situation around them makes them do. And uh, that kind of uh, passive acceptance of external conditions is, is, is terrible, I think. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is a big name in the academe. He is a famous and highly sought after professor in the field of psychology, best known for his work in the study of happiness and creativity. You have to understand uh, very well one as domain of culture, a domain would be like mathematics or religion or music or art. Uh, you have to be very good at one domain. You have to then break away for, from that domain and say, this is good, but I can do better here some, some and then try to do better. And then you need uh, what I call a field, which is a group of people who are gatekeepers to the domain. And the field has to feel that what you think is better is really better, and then they have to say, okay, now uh, your mathematical theory, theorem is so good that we'll make that part of mathematics. So your idea now becomes part of the domain so that the next generation of children will learn your theory too. Uh, and the same thing with everything else. Most obstacles are obstacles of conventional wisdom. Uh, if people say, well, you, you can't do it this way, or you shouldn't do this, uh, then uh, you just challenge that conventional wisdom because uh, conventional wisdom didn't get to be conventional wisdom because it's true. It, it got to be conventional wisdom because it's easy to repeat uh, and people like repeating it and they sound smart when they, when they do repeat it. And so maybe that's really the aspect of creativity is uh, identifying when you're running into conventional wisdom and uh, not having a whole lot of respect for it and, and challenging it whenever you can. Creativity in my own words will be, can be defined something like this, the mental characteristic of a person to think out of the box and to offer something new which was not there before. Rajendra Prasadi is a successful businessman in the creative fields of fashion and architecture. While he never had any formal training in design, he has always been artistic and says he was lucky enough to have found areas of business where he could pursue his creative talents. In, in my business, when I apply the same logic, I would rather go back in time and tell you about the denims, which was a workwear used by mine laborers in uh, California which was a hard cloth and later when it was put into fashion it became a fashion symbol all over the world and took the whole fashion industry by storm. So a, a workwear becoming a fashion symbol and the gap is filled with something called creativity. So that is something which you think out of the box 
and your ability to think out of the box and bring something extremely innovative and novel is called creative. Their dissatisfaction with the status quo, their ability to see things differently and their constant yearning to produce something better are what propel these out-of-the-box thinkers to take that courageous leap into the unknown. And what they bring back is something short of spectacular. Our challenge is to make ordinary people do extraordinary things. Our challenge is to make people dream of catching the stars and putting it in their pocket. A creative individual is one who can come up with an idea, a concept, create something from what he has in his environment or something he has in his mind. It could be anything from an idea to something that's innovative, that changes how man basically does things or functions or eases the difficulty that man has. Many have pinpointed this to a pattern of thinking, a thinking process, the ability of the, ind of the individual to piece different aspects of his thinking and his environment to create something new. So I find that in creativity, the primary thing is, um, is hearing something in one place, hearing something else in some other place, and somehow your mind puts it together, right? It is a, v and you did not exactly create anything. We just assembled them. God creates, we assemble. Whereas most of us are stuck in the here and now, creative people are able to look forward, think ahead, and conjure up concepts that bring drastic changes to the way we live and work. Ultimately, their crazy ideas are those which enable mankind to keep progressing. Whether purposefully or not, they leave the world a better place for our children and for our children's children. The most powerful force for transformation this planet has is the power of human mind. When you arouse that human mind to do something truly extraordinary, then the result will be stunning. Another reason that these individuals are so successful is that they were capable of finding solutions to the problems that befell their business models during the difficult early years. An optimist sees challenges and says, okay, here is something which I can uh, excel in, I can bring new solutions to the world, I can solve. A pessimist looks at problems and says, you know, these are problems and I can't do anything. I always tell this very simple and very lovely story of the two shoe salesmen, now well known. They went to Africa in the 1800s to find out if they could sell shoes. And they reported back to their company in Manchester in England saying, one wrote a telegram saying, situation hopeless, they don't wear shoes. The other one wrote, glorious opportunity, they don't have any shoes yet. Now those are two statements describing the identical situation. They're both looking at the same thing. One sees situation hopeless. The other says glorious opportunity. We don't have any shoes yet. Now that choice is a permanent choice in the life of every single human being at every moment of every day. In the book, Art of Possibility, which he co-authored with his wife, Rosamund, Zander teaches people to step outside what he calls constructed realities he inspires them to realize their potential by seeing the possibility in every situation that arises. You have a choice in life every time you open your mouth, every time you take any action. You can choose either to act or speak in the, what we call the downward spiral, competition, fear, anxiety, pressure, all that 
stuff, what we call the downward spiral, or you can speak in possibility. Right? Possibility is an open-ended domain. There is a discipline, a life discipline, which enables you to choose possibility rather than to choose the downward spiral. Most people, including top executives, choose the downward spiral. The reason is they're brought up and trained to worry, to worry about the competition, to worry about fear, or worry about making mistakes, worry about somebody else may do better than, you know, that whole package. They're, they're like this all the time. If you're like this all the time, the body doesn't work well. The body works well when it's open, when it's relaxed, when it's alive, when it's in fun, having playful, feeling playful, then we do well and our mind works very well. The trouble is the mind closes down when you get fearful. Those are new, not good postures for creative thinking. You can be creative when you're sort of under pressure. Happier people are more creative, they're more productive, um, they're healthier, they have stronger immune systems. They're better negotiators, they're more happily married, they make better friends, um, they're more charitable and generous. Everybody in the world looks for meaning and purpose in life. You know, Viktor Frankl is one of the most influential thinkers of the last century. And he wrote many books, but uh, the most significant one, I think, was Man's Search for Meaning, where he talked about happiness. And he had understood what makes people happy. It was not about the pursuit of happiness. He said, happiness cannot be pursued, happiness ensues. It is the outcome of living a life of meaning and purpose, where you're part of some work that actually is making a positive difference in the world. It comes from loving without condition, and it comes from finding meaning in your suffering. Everybody has suffering in their life. If you can find some meaning out of that, and make something positive, learn some lessons from that, grow from it, you know, that's where ultimately you're going to be happy. Do these geniuses make the right choices all the time? Are they often sure about their decisions? And are their decisions always based on facts? No. But more often than not, they listen to their instincts. These creative individuals use their intuitions to seek out opportunities and act upon them. The opportunities are in front of many, many people. Uh, what happens is they don't take advantage of them. They don't put 100% or more than 100% effort to take advantage of them. You know, there's a saying which says, um, luck favors the prepared mind, right? So uh, the preparation is actually by doing the hard work and being, being ready to take advantage of the situation. I have as much trust in my intuition as my rational thinking. In fact, I trust my intuition even more. Because many times, we could fool ourselves into convincing ourselves about anything. If you decide to buy a red sports car, you will find wonderful reasons why you should buy it. If you decide that you didn't want to buy the red sports car, you will find wonderful reasons why you should not buy it. So what then is truth? So we find that there's a lot of thinking that happens in us. Many times over the course of life, as we fail and we succeed and we learn lessons from them, we learned that when we failed, something deep within us told us we shouldn't have probably done that. And we overruled that and we failed. When we succeeded, we realized something deep within us told us we should do that. We succeeded. So we said, my God, what if I spent most of my time listening to something deep within me? And I find personally in my life that if I believe in my intuition and execute on it, as if it was as real a conclusion that came out of logical, rational thinking. I had the same confidence, same belief, and same faith in that non-conscious thought and that intuition that came. And if I could execute on it with the same vigor, as if it was presented to me in a PowerPoint. Because the non-conscious intuitive mind does not do Microsoft Office, all right? So you just get this feeling, and therefore you have to act on it. But it is as if it is real. And if you could act on it as if it was real, success does follow. Intuition is there for, for a reason. It's, it's, uh, um, 
it's uh, evolved uh, as a way to make uh, snap decisions based on a very large uh, amount of, of inputs that you're not consciously aware of. And so people with a, with a well-tuned intuition uh, should trust it because it, it, it got to be there through hundreds and hundreds of years of evolution, letting us make quick decisions uh, when we don't have time to, to sit there and think about them. So it's the intuition that uh, you know, prevented our, uh, saved our ancestors with good intuition from you know, thinking that there may be some danger lurking in, you know, in that grass. Maybe there's a tiger there or something. They don't really exactly know why, but they've seen enough enough things just happened in the environment where their brain said, okay, don't go over there. Um, and sometimes that's wrong, but very often that's correct. And that, that feeling, that intuition has been honed by hundreds of millions of years to be quite effective. Luck doesn't walk down the street with a sticker saying, I am your luck. Chance doesn't walk down the street saying, I am that chance. It does not, right? But somehow some of us seem to recognize it. Why? Because we recognize that the unplanned will happen and we are planning all the time to welcome the unplanned. If you're always ready to throw a party for the unplanned, then somehow the unplanned good luck seems to walk into your house because you were ready for it with a party. So I think as an entrepreneur, Ideas are important, action is very important, but planning for the unplanned, learning to recognize it, learning to embrace it, and learning to incorporate it in what you do is very important, and the critical ingredient to success. And so the process of creation begins. What do you do with a bright idea, a positive attitude, and a willingness to embrace the unknown? How do you turn them into an amazing invention that could eventually help the rest of mankind? Ideation without execution is mere delusion. What creates a genius, what creates a leader, is shifting from the ideas to actually delivering results around those ideas. Execution. Execution is the thing that will turn a spark into a flame, a fuzzy thought into a winning creation. It's the innovation that gets noticed, the model that wins the medal, and eventually the product that hits record sales. There are a lot of creative ideas people can sit and daydream. But if you don't know how to translate them and persevere and become an evangelist to tell the world why this is going to be, why this creation is something that's going to change the world. And that has to come from the bottom of your heart. Which means creativity and innovation has to blend. That's the greatness of people like Steve Jobs. Otherwise, you look around the valley, there are probably one success for every 100 or 300 failures. It's not that the 300 failures didn't have the creativity. They just didn't know how to translate into an innovation and into an execution. There is so much creativity in taking an idea all the way to it being born as a company. But not just being born as a company, taking it all the way from your first client to a repeat business, to the second client, and to the hundredth client, and then taking it all the way into either getting going public, or getting acquired, or building a vibrant business. In every step of the way, there is the creative aspect, and there is the execution aspect. Creativity and execution should go hand in hand. Without one, the other is meaningless. If all you can do is to execute, and you don't have that breakthrough thinking, you can never win. If all you have are breakthrough thoughts and you cannot execute on them, you will never win. It is the right hand and the left hand working together. The core idea, the idea itself is, is almost worthless. There's, there's many, many, many great ideas. And there's many people that can come up with great ideas. 99% uh, of the value is the execution. Um, 
And there's a huge difference between those two things. The brilliant idea is, is, uh, is actually not as rare as people think. Uh, what's really rare is combining that spark with the ability to actually, to actually see it through, to actually execute, and most importantly, to not lose interest. Leibniz says one could even just borrow or adopt somebody else's idea and turn it into something far better than what was originally imagined by its creator. It is the engineers, the fabricators, and the dedicated implementers who run with that idea, put a form into it, and actually make it work. That makes all the difference. They are the real innovators. You don't need to be the first person to think of something. In fact, in business at least, very rarely is the first company to think of something the one that succeeds. You know, Google wasn't the first search engine. You know, Facebook wasn't the first social site. You know, Zynga wasn't the first game company. The, the breakout companies, the ones that are worth billions and billions of dollars, um, they're usually not the very first ones with an idea. They were the first ones to take that idea and to execute it almost flawlessly. And the execution basically comes down to removing all of the complexity to enable more and more users in the mainstream to actually use your product. Some innovations take only a few years, even just months, to develop and reach maturation. Most don't attain a level of readiness or perfection until many, many years of patient, meticulous and dedicated hard work. I think a lot of very smart, very creative people, their flaw is that they, they lose interest because uh, once they've been thinking about something for a year, five years, ten years, they get bored and they want to move on and think about something else, but it takes five or ten or twenty years to actually accomplish something real, so you have to be creative enough to have a good idea, but not so creative that you get bored with it easily so you can really stick through it and see it through. So the guy who is in the IT industry who says, I'm going to create a new software and it's going to be in the field of animations and I'd like to do it within this particular area is far more likely to succeed than someone who says, you know, I should have been the one who won the prize because I had more ideas than him. You probably did. But the guy in the other cubicle sat and worked on it and he achieved it. So success and creativity basically come when you put in the time and the effort. And unless you do that in a systematic way, it becomes difficult. There is no substitute for hard work. Work hard and success follows. So what is it that truly drives these creative people to stick to it and see it through? Is it just their brilliant minds, hard work and sheer perseverance? Or maybe something a little bit more? Something powerful enough, compelling enough and absorbing enough to keep them running very long periods of time? Most successful people in the world in general are people that have found what they're passionate about and are doing it every day. And uh, that's kind of what I, over time, learned uh, in the early days. I guess my definition of success was probably like a lot of other people's, which was about focusing more on making money and building businesses that could make a lot of money. But just over time, really found that what's more important to me is really just uh, being passionate about whatever it is that I'm doing. Most people that actually get something done don't, don't start with thinking about the process of innovation, the process of, of creativity they just have a real passion for something they want to see in the world, something they want to see in the universe that doesn't exist, and uh, they just work tirelessly to, to achieve it. When a creative feeling comes to me, I actually, if it's really pure, it's actually that something that comes through me. It's almost like, uh, I hate to use this word because it, people will misinterpret it, uh, it's almost like I'm channeling uh, something that's bigger than me, and I'm just the vehicle that's going to help to express it to the world. 
Chip Conley is a hotelier, author, and speaker. He founded Joy de Vivre Hotels, which he began in 1987 at the age of 26. When I see it as that, first of all, I feel less possessive of it and less ego around it. But I feel actually more compelled to be in service to it and to actually communicate about it. So it's very easy when you feel like something's coming through you and it feels pure and it feels important to be expressed. You feel like you're a missionary for the message. It's very easy to lose sleep, but you're not losing sleep. I, when I say lose sleep, I mean want to work on it and spend time on it all the time and to actually be in a place where uh, it becomes almost an obsession. I'm basically a painter, an artist. I built hotels, but I've never used an engineer or an architect. Steve Borgia is a hotelier, author, and speaker. He founded the Indeco Leisure Hotels in India. I've conceived, I've dreamt of hotels. I make my set stand and live forever. That's why when people come and say, wow, beautiful, because it is not engineered. It is manifested out of a very divine passion. Somebody has taught me how to do instantly. You get my point? This is, this is not uh, driven by books, not by knowledge, not by internet. I believe very, very passionately that there is something called divine intelligence. It is not classified. It is not territorial. It is universal. And I think it is grace. It is available for you, me, and for everybody. For me, the fundamental, the most important thing is to understand yourself. Who are you? What would you like to do? What are the sets of activities that completely absorb you, that put you in a moment of what might be called flow, where you lose track of time? This is the thing that I was meant to do. If you get that feeling and you're working in a line that allows you and gives you lots of opportunities to engage in that kind of absorption and flow, then you're likely to be happy a lot of the time. And that to me is the ultimate yardstick of success. I think when you finally connect with your passion, that one thing that causes you to feel that you, know, you don't want to sleep, you, you just, you would die on the sword for that vision, then your life begins to change. I believe that when a person is passionate about something, when he has a vision which is much bigger than he is, and this vision in some way brings a greater good to a greater community, when he is completely enveloped in such a vision and has to be bigger than he is, then he automatically becomes creative. So if you think, how can I become creative? My advice is find something that you are so passionate about that you would do anything to achieve it. And this has to be a cause which is bigger than you are and which brings some good to a greater community. Then you don't have to think about how can I be creative. Creativity will flower inside you in ways you can't even imagine. Finally, and perhaps this is most important of all, creative individuals know who they are. They're aware of their talents, hopeful of their dreams, and are happy in what they do, and are not afraid to be a little different. The best business people, they're not afraid to be a little strange. They're not afraid to march th to their own drummer. Why does uh, Steve Jobs wear the black turtlenecks? Why does Warren Buffett eat a hamburger and drink Coca-Cola every day for lunch? If you look at the billionaires, you look at the best entrepreneurs, they're all a little eccentric. Why? because they have the character strength to be comfortable in their own skin. And why is that valuable in business? Because ultimately, most people who pursue a vision, as soon as they get criticized, they give up. You have to be really, really strong in your own skin, your own values, your own vision. There's a lot of people out there who are gonna give you advice that's gonna be generic advice based upon what worked for them or what the newspaper says about 10 years from now, this is the profession that's going to be the biggest profession. Disregard all of that advice. Uh, instead, focus on what makes you passionate. Uh, if you were at age seven years old, you were in the mud making mud pies, maybe you should be a pastry chef. <laughs> um, and uh, understand that there are certain things that come naturally to you 
that as a child or as a teenager or as a young adult can be great clues to what you could be successful at as, as an adult. And uh, don't disregard those clues. Those clues are going to tell you a lot more than a career counselor could ever tell you because they're about you. They're not about some generic you. So in essence, be self-aware, understand what you're good at, and then go pursue that even if it, it isn't conventionally wise to do that. What is it all about? Going from point A to point B. There's only one way to go from point A to point B. The right way. Yeah? But I can come, I can do go in thousands of other ways. But they're not the right way. Thousands of other ways. But you can go in thousands of other ways. But the right way to go is only one way and that's the truth. And that's focus. And it's all about perseverance. That's focus. You go on focusing, then you do it. I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Thomas Edison. Mankind's Journey is a book that will not end for thousands, perhaps millions of years. The reason we continue to thrive against all odds is that of revolutionary minds of the past, the present, and the future. Monuments and tributes are paid to people who have the courage to pursue their own vision and make their own dreams become a reality. Innately, every human being has the capacity to rise beyond itself, to succeed when you think that you won't succeed. But to realize that to do all that, you need to stop and admire what you have around you. And the final advice is go for it. The world is changing, your company is changing. Do what you think is right. You may not win, but at least you can look in the mirror and say, what the heck, at least I tried. Old people almost never regret the risk they took and failed. They almost always regret the risk they failed to take. Who will join the next wave of pioneers? Will you stand up for change?